Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm going to do a quick video on the importance of using test plates on transmissions um, if you're building transmissions in volume, if you're doing it occupationally. Uh, if you're a DYIer and you're building one or two, you know, maybe a handful at most, they're still important, but if you're doing it occupationally, I believe they're absolutely critical. And here's why. So the situation is we have uh, this transmission case fully assembled, 4L60E, it's a uh, 2001 model year unit, and we're putting air into the forward clutch feed circuit here, and we're getting a lot of blow-by and air coming out of the 3-4 clutch. So you should never have uh, a situation where when you put air into one feed circuit, you're getting a ton of air coming out of the other. A tiny little bit uh, of air Maybe if you're running 100 plus PSI into the clutch circuit, that might be okay. But I'm putting about 60 PSI into the forward circuit, and I'm getting nearly that much out of the 3-4 circuit. So I know that there's something wrong, and when I was installing the pump, it was kind of bumpy going in. And I said, okay, then this might have to come back out. But, you know, we'll see what happens when we do, um, you know, the case air check. So... I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put some air into the forward clutch uh, feed circuit and then I'm gonna put a shop towel here over the three four circuit. So here's the forward circuit and then here's the three four circuit right here. And I'll show you how much air is coming out of there. Okay, and you can even hear air circulating in and around, you know, that forward drum, which means we're getting cross leaks between one of the turbine shaft ceiling rings. Uh, uh, my guess is probably the third ring from the top, so we're second ring from the bottom. There's four total ceiling rings, and the three four clutch and the forward clutch are partitioned by that second ring from the bottom. So anyway, we're going to take the uh, pump out and then we're going to inspect the ceiling rings and see if my theory is right. And if so, we just replace that ceiling ring and then we'll come back and redo the air test. Okay, so we got the pump out of the way and we're just looking at the forward drum here, the turbine shaft, and we see a little sliver of uh, ceiling ring material there. Uh, that by itself shouldn't be enough to cause the kind of cross leak we have, so um, we got to look a little bit deeper, a little bit further. So here is your uh, overrun ceiling rings, and then here are your forwards. So this ceiling ring and this ceiling ring uh, seal off the overrun clutch circuit. This ceiling ring here and this ceiling ring seal off the forward circuit. And then this uh, third ceiling ring down and the fourth uh, seal off the 3-4 clutch circuit. So. When you have a cross leak like that between um, forward and three four, it's usually this ceiling ring right here, the one I'm moving around with my middle finger. So I'm gonna take the gasket out, and then <clears throat> we'll take we'll take the two drums out, and then we'll take a closer look at that ceiling ring to see if it's either flattened or otherwise damaged in some way. All right, now with the drum on the bench, we'll take a closer look at these ceiling rings and see if uh, either this ceiling ring or any of the other rings are cut up or damaged in any way. I actually don't see anything obvious other than this piece of ceiling ring material right there. And it's not clear that it came from uh, this ceiling ring here, which is where uh, the damage would have to have occurred for me to have cross leaks between the forward and the 3-4 clutch circuit. So nothing real obvious. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to replace this ceiling ring here out of an abundance of caution. Uh, who knows, it, you know, it could be flat in a way that I'm just not seeing. Um, looks like there might be a, a little bit of a nick right here. You know, or, uh, you know, an area where I may have cut it or it got a little flattened. It's impossible to say, but it doesn't take much. If you have, uh, you know, even just a very subtle flat spot, that's enough to give you a cross leak. And when it's real pronounced like that, um, you're better off just taking the drum out and taking another look 
and seeing if uh, you need to replace any of these sealing rings because you know you want to do it now versus having to deal with it if it comes back because either you get in third gear starts or it's slipping in forward or whatever the case may be but uh, bottom line is that when you do your case air check like you saw me demonstrate you know earlier uh, you do not want to have any air coming out of that 3-4 feed circuit, you know, when you're putting air into the forward clutch feed. So out of an abundance of caution, I decided to just simply replace all four ceiling rings. Um, I couldn't see anything obvious, and maybe this is kind of overreacting, but at the same token, uh, I don't want any problems with this thing once it, you know, leaves my shop. So got all new ceiling rings installed. I got a you know a fairly big bin full of these things these and the uh, uh, the pump stator ceiling rings it's always a good idea to have extras of stuff like this anything you have to kind of expand and then resize or any any kind of seal or ceiling ring or whatever lip seal that um, you know might get damaged on the way in is maybe a little cumbersome or you know a little bit challenging to either install or fully seat or whatever uh, the situation might be. Uh, you always want to have extras. I mean, you know, those of you that have built, obviously, you know that. But for those that are, you know, getting into the industry or new, um, you know, or maybe just looking to kind of DIY build their own, um, it's a good idea to have extras of stuff like this and maybe some of the bushings and anything else that is small and easily, you know, easily breakable. All right, we have everything back together and the test plate bolted back to the case. So we're gonna see what happens. Um, we're gonna start with the forward clutch. And what I'll do is I'm gonna put up a shop towel over the 3-4 so you can see what, if anything, comes out of that 3-4 uh, test port. There should be nothing. Uh, if the shop towel does move at all, um, it should move, you know, kind of be pushed uh, you know, toward the bench just because air will be coming out of the nozzle right here but I'm going to do the best I can to try to prevent that from happening. Okay, so forward clutch. I'm going to put my hand here just so it doesn't blow off. Okay, that's good positive apply. And all the air you're hearing is coming out of the nozzle. There's a tiny little bit of air coming from there, but again, fluid is a lot thicker than air. Um, air is going to bypass things that fluid will not bypass. So if you get a little tiny bit of air coming out of the 3-4 clutch when you're you know, putting air in the forward or even the overrun, it's not the end of the world. But what you don't want to see is as much, if not more, air coming out of the 3-4 when you're putting air in the forward and vice versa. So now we'll test the 3-4 clutch. Okay, when you put air in the 3-4 clutch, there is, you know, will be fluid, i.e. air, um, in behind the forward piston because the 3-4 pack, when it applies, the forward clutch is also applied. Forward clutch is a non-working clutch. As soon as you put your vehicle into drive, uh, the forward clutch is going to be on and stay on until you put it in either neutral, reverse, or park. So uh, it's normal to have some air come out of the forward clutch when you're putting air in the 3-4 clutch, but it should not happen in reverse. Okay, so when you do your overrun, just plug your forward clutch feed. And then reverse input. Okay, that sounds real nice. You're always going to have a little bit of air coming out of the reverse input because there is a lot of bleed off. Uh, it's designed um, to bleed off very efficiently when you're not in reverse. So you don't want any centrifugal apply in the uh, reverse input clutch. So I'm just do uh, the servos. So here's fourth gear. And what I'm doing is I'm sticking my middle finger uh, right on the band because I want to feel it grab that drum when I put air into this port. It's grabbing, and then as soon as I let off, it returns immediately to be at rest. Okay, this is a 4x4 unit. So I'm able to easily spin the output shaft 
opposite in the direction of uh, engine rotation. So if you're looking at, you know, if this thing was right side up and as it would be in the vehicle, um, I am spinning the output shift counterclockwise, which happens when you're in reverse. If this was binding up, then we would have to take uh, the servo out and maybe grind a little bit off the pin, you know, a little bit off the end of the pin to give us the clearance we want. You want an eighth of an inch clearance back here. So anyway, uh, we'll do second gear and then we'll wrap. Yep, perfect. So uh, that's the deal with air test plates. This is why it is so important to have them for transmissions uh, that do not have what I will call an open belly design. So an open belly design or open belly configuration is where you just have uh, feed ports here in the rear and in the front. And then the rest of the case is open, so you can actually put your hands on all the internals, uh, you know, all your drums, your sun shell, your gear train, or, you know, whatever is exposed. Um, those are going to be uh, some of your early Ford and Dodge transmissions, uh, your, you know, Chrysler 727s, A904s, and then, um, you know, the, the four speeds that came after them. For GMs, all these are going to be what I call a closed case design, which means that you have one solid flat um belly with worm tracks in it for the apply circuit so uh, for transmissions like that uh, as well as um, some of the later ford units you want to have a test plate unless all of the feed circuits are readily accessible um, without any kind of fancy you know air nozzles that kind of bend up and um, you know kind of conform to the shape of the worm tracks because that's what you would need if you wanted to do um, a comprehensive air check on the case uh, without this test plate once it was fully assembled, but before you put the spacer plate, gaskets, and valve body and whatnot on. All right, uh, hope that helped you. Um, these plates can be found on eBay and uh, Transtar and other places. Uh, they're not that expensive. I want to say this one was maybe like 80 bucks, 90 bucks. Um, I've had it for years. I don't know exactly when I bought it, and, you know, probably about seven or eight years ago at this point. And I have several of them for all the transmissions that I do where, uh, you know, uh, the transmission cases of uh, a closed case design. So anyway, thanks again for watching. As always, if you have any questions, comments, go ahead and leave them below. Otherwise, um, enjoy the rest of your day or evening, and we'll catch you on the next video.